I made an accidental. You are an accidental. <laughs> I gotta run to the bathroom or I'm gonna have an accidental. Hello and welcome to the Quackcast. This is Quackcast number 463. I'm Ozan Ocean and with me is Tan Serene and Baines. Hello, my people. Hello. My my uh, sexy ducklings. That's... Uh... Don't do that, please. <laughs> this is quite disturbing. Um, well, it is if you say ducklings. Anyway, um... This is the Sex Position Quackcast. This is uh, based on Tatsis News Post of a few weeks ago, which is quite interesting, mainly focusing on things like Game of Thrones, which is uh, part of the current fad of so-called sex position. Well, at least that's what they have. Uh, sex position, that's a, um, a portmanteau of sex and exposition. I've added those two things together to make this new word sex position, um, which is, yeah, uh, good, good enough term for this kind of uh, silly fad in uh, media at the moment, and I will argue that this is just a repetition of what's happened many times before, due to many uh, cultural kind of influences. Um, so that's what we're going to talk about. But before we get into that, I have to bring up the featured comic for the week, which uh, I gave to people. This is a comic that uh, uh, I reviewed. And there is no sex position in this comic, which is interesting. None at all. It is a very safe for the family comic. It's it's very good in that way. It's called Shrouded RD, and I hope you enjoy it. <laughs> Hello, I'm Ozone Ocean, and my feature for the week was Shrouded RD. There aren't many survivors left unscathed in this post-apocalyptic world, you have to make friends where you can find them. With that in mind, Devil befriends Sister when he saves her from being attacked by a violent man. Sister is a friendly robot that seems to only want the best for people. Devil is a tough but kindly guy and an amazing fighter. Together, they make a great team. They encounter many fellow survivors. But sometimes the friendliest face hides the direst evil. The art here is fully digital. It's uh, grey, black and white. It's stylized, consistent and cool. The story is action-adventure post-apocalyptic drama. I like this a comic. I'm not sure if it has just finished now because the ending page of it seems to be a very good place for um, an absolute end, I'm not sure, but uh, well, let's see how it goes. Um, either way, you've got a whole bunch of pages to get into for this story. This is not a uh, just a story that's just beginning. This is a story that is just, you know, there's the full range of it there. You can go right from beginning to end. It's not that long. Maybe about 100 pages or so, so far. I'm not sure if there will be any more, but yeah, it's um very readable, fantastic little story. Uh, yeah, it's a bit of a uh, subversion of the zombie uh, trope, or the zombie theme story. So it's, this has an interesting take on it. There are a bunch of tropes in this comic that are subverted in really interesting ways, and I like that. It's good. And, you know, even the title, Shrouded, has a particular meaning for this comic, which you'll find as you read it. I hope you find it anyway. So I hope you enjoy Shrouded RD. This is a comic by SCV01. That's the uh, creator's name. And it's rated T, so it's uh, good for, you know, quite a good age range of people. So uh, enjoy Shrouded RD. <laughs> and that was Shrouded RD. I hope you liked, the, uh, liked my review. And I hope that makes you go and read it because I really love this comic. It's so good. Okay, um, after that we have our featured music that Gumwallis has given us. Gumwallis has given us the theme to a comic called Accidentals. A gathering of forces, powerful energies, coalesce. Let the epic battle commence. Dark times lie ahead. 
for Earth's Mightiest Heroes. This is an orchestral war anthem for superhumans. This theme would go perfectly over the opening credits of an A-grade superhero film. So, take it away, Gum Wallace, with the theme to Accidentals. And I hope he used, I hope, Gun Wallace, you used a lot of uh, additional, like, sharps and flats in the, the musical piece. <laughs> Anybody know what I'm talking about? Sharps that's an, and flats. It, yes, where you raise a note and lower a note, but you do it, like, kind of out of key in the piece, because in written music, that's called an accidental. You just have, like, one note is, like, written as a sharp. Like, an, instead of an A, it's, a, it's one semitone higher. It's an A sharp. Okay. Or one lowers an A flat. So in music notation, that's called an accidental. I was just doing a thing. Gun Wallace, you know what I'm talking about. Back me up here. <laughs> All right. Oh, well, I will put that in. And... Call in. Yeah, I, I will keep <laughs> that in the crack cast. Okay. <laughs> Take it away. Gun Wallace oh, yeah, that's accidental. <laughs> to the accidentals oh actually it's just called accidentals in all caps it's a interesting comic about a bunch of superheroes all different superheroes actually little superhero teams and their different stories and uh yeah it'll probably be featured at some stage but it can't be at the moment because it hasn't updated it uh since december so when mm -hmm. it uh, updates again maybe it will be uh Featured because it's an excellent little comic. So, the subject of today's quack cast is sex position, which was a topic that Tansarin came up with a few weeks ago, and now we're going to chat a bite it. But first, I want to try and put it in a bit of a more of a cultural context. So, recently, it has been exemplified by such uh, TV shows as Game of Thrones, and also to a lesser extent, The Witcher. And some other TV shows. Now, what do these things have in common? I ask you. I ask you, the viewer. Well, I'll tell you. What they have in common is they're mainly online streaming shows. Uh, through um, And also, they were p uh, pioneered by um, uh, TV channels that were more um, uh, towards the pay TV or cable TV. So HBO, uh, Netflix, this kind of thing. So these are non-traditional uh, media um, broadcast options, which means the censorship that traditionally affected things like uh, over-the-air TV that we used to have in the old days isn't such a thing with this, these forms of uh, media communication. So what happens is there's a loosening of the standards, which also means the writers and the producers, whatever, the people who make these kind of things can put in more content than they would have wouldn't have been able to do normally that's why we have more sex in these things it's not just because tastes change or anything like this because our tastes always go towards this in some way and i will bring up uh examples uh of this in that in the past we've also had similar situations many times where standards have been relaxed for various reasons 
so back when um, this media first was created, you know, film and TV first was created back in the 1920s, 1930s, when it was really starting to uh, get uh, a cultural toehold, we had this happen. So stories started to have more sexual content, and that really happened in a big way. You'd be quite shocked with the amount of sex you can find in old silent films. Then the uh, rest of the culture caught up with it, political uh there was political pressure applied to these things you know uh, also from other cultural groups like religious groups things like that censorship came in and that changed and then that was out in other countries and i'm talking about like the usa and hollywood that changed but in other countries they're a bit slower to change maybe um uh, in certain places in europe that was a bit slower to change but it did eventually come along and the sex went out of it but so we did actually have this same kind of situation in the past and that was way 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 back in the 1920s you know 100 years ago now later on we had this this kept on reappearing so in the 1960s 1970s we had this happen again in film standards relaxed we had it coming in especially in uh europe um you know the uh, like Italy, places like that. Uh, you'll see, uh, like, um, uh, there's many famous directors who are very famous for having a lot of sex in their films. And this, these aren't porn films. These are looked at as being art films because the standards did not apply that strongly to those. Then we had um, uh, certain TV series in Australia um, that I know of um, because uh, the TV shows were, the standards were relaxed if they're on after a certain time, like nine o'clock at night or 12 o'clock. So you had sex in them. There was a famous one called number 96. This was a soap TV series where it had, you know, the full range of human sexuality. You had uh, nudity and sex in there and also story elements, you know, that, that just happened. This was you know, many years ago, like 50, 40 years ago. And that's what they had as a common thing because standards were relaxed. And of course, then we have the, um, you know, the, the pushback when culture uh, changes and people get angry at this kind of thing. And then that's not allowed again. Um, we had also uh, porn films in the, uh, the late 70s were becoming mainstream. So no longer were they just porn. They were actually um, almost uh, mainstream. And they had, uh, the story was a much greater element sex was not that great an element but it was basically they had you know sex position in these these were serious films that just happened to have sex and the standards allowed that at the day before there was pushback and no longer did you have sex in cinemas because this was actually porn films in mainstream cinema um so that got pushed back again um uh, when uh, cable tv first came in and pay tv we had a similar kind of thing um, and uh, of course the growth of the D movie with uh, that made stars out of people like Julie Strain, poor old Julie Strain who people thought she was dead the other day, she's not dead uh, the D movies which were straight to video, so that's another thing, the straight to video films they had the the growth of the, the sexual scenes and sexual positions, so again that was another cultural factor before culture kicked in and you know uh, created more standards so we have like ma15 and all sorts of uh, ratings that precluded that reduced the audience so that was a uh, financial pressure on these uh you know this media to stop including that much uh, sexuality so now again we have the whole cycle repeating but through the internet because you know that's the new factor in you know uh, people can get away with things and of course they get away with the first thing they're going to do is increasing sex in, in films because that is a very easy way of getting eyes on the screen. It's proven in advertising. It's proven in, you know, culture in general, like Tance was telling us about in the Patreon video, which is, uh, you should, uh, uh, we love you patrons for actually uh, paying the money and watching the video, but Tance was talking about, say, cheerleading. So this is the same kind of thing in sports. So we have that that kind of, you know, sex over-sexuality in sport for no reason it shouldn't be in there because it's just sport and yet they have this to attract the viewer's eyes so okay with, oh, uh, 
I'll just uh, just finish off. So oh, now I haven't finished off. Specifically, we're talking about um, not specifically, but now we're talking about uh, the current form of it in so Game of Thrones and stuff like that in the these internet um, these TV shows that the internet has allowed to be in this way. Okay, so yeah, Game of Thrones, The Witcher, and Water of Earls, and you know the impact of that, the the reason for it. The positives and negatives because there's obviously negatives and yeah so we'll have a have a, a talk about this so go ahead guys sorry for um uh being uh um, you know taking over everything but yeah go ahead Tans, right. you have the floor um no i would like uh Baines to sound off first and then i'll I'll say my piece because I might be long winded. Okay. Okay. Well, first of all, a very interesting historical perspective. I have nine things to add. <laughs> <laughs> I, was just, I hear this, I listen to this political guy, this uh, like independent political news guy, and that's how the way he talks. He always like, uh, right. I agree with you 100%. I have seven <laughs> things to add. <laughs> he'll say three I, but to me i was like i gotta do a parody of that i agree with you i just uh want to change everything you said <laughs> everything like exactly that. from top to bottom everything you just said. <laughs> no uh, uh to me well what this says the uh, tense's original article i'm sure it's linked in the quack cast notes there is uh, is fascinating too um about how you can show character through sex how people are doing it what they're doing what they're not doing and, and so on but she said it all very well uh, to me, I think about somewhat related is a the idea of uh, showing something interesting as exposition is going on. I mean, just the, the word itself, that's what it makes me think of initially, like kind of mm -hmm. like a, a screenwriting or comic writing trick uh, or any kind of writing trick, really, like where something some, something is going on that's like unusual or compelling and doesn't have to be sexual or anything. But um, one screenwriting person calls it the Pope in the pool. Huh. So you see something like really odd that kind of captures your attention. And that can be a little bit of a crutch to get you through, you know, like if you have a lot of exposition that you really need to get through. Mm. Um, so it can be like that. It can be somewhat of a distraction. You mentioned that the PIs meeting in the, in the strip club is kind of like a little bit of eye candy to help sell. <clears throat> And stuff like that. Low budget movies like the sort of um, well, what's that dude's name? We'd produce Toxic Avenger and all those. Uh, Lloyd Kaufman those from uh, the Trauma films. Uh, right, like he's but the producer guy above him was like uh, ah, his his name is just slipping my mind, you know. But he did all those you know great movies. Ro Roger Corman, Roger Corman, yeah. Oh, Roger Corman, really. Like a lot of his movies, and definitely more Lloyd Kaufman's type of stuff, would there were exploitation films. But even if there wasn't a lot of that content, they would make an effort to throw something like that in, because mm -hmm. it helps sell the movie, or they'll even give it a saucy title. Like <laughs> sometimes I read about this movie that had a completely different title, and it was completely not a lot going on in it. But they like to sell the movie to a distributor. They they named it Teenage Cat Girls in Heat. <laughs> Yes. That that allowed them to like sell the movie just based on this like suggestive title kind of thing. There were so many films like that because that's a particular genre. So you know, faster, faster, pussycat, kill, kill, and all this. Right. And... What's that aren't time? those aren't those exploitation films though? It's they are not they are not exactly what we're talking about in the sense of uh, sex position. That's true. Yeah, they I wonder. More, they are more in the exploitation genre in uh, in broad trajectories of course it's not that they don't have elements of um of position in it but yeah the thing i wanted to to say if bains bains uh sorry have you finished your i think i'm points? done i was just wandering into the woods there for some reason yeah so you're, you're okay. right <laughs> So um, the thing I wanted to, to say is that I think there is a differentiation that is critically different than 
um, than the historical background that very accurately was uh, presented. And it's the thing that it's not just that this exposition is supposed at least okay to include the context of the sex that is being on screen tied to the to the scene that is uh, happening like the 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 exposition that is taking place has some kind of connection to the sex that is uh, uh, taking place on the screen in a, in a way at least um or 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 the characters are involved in it somehow meaningfully quote unquote at or at least in a very veiled connection to the sex it's not just we are talking and someone photobombs with their boobs in a sense right. okay uh, at, at least um, i don't think that that is the point of the definition and in the say in the game of thrones thing when they inserted all the sex scenes, usually they were part of the narrative per se. They were not like tack-ons, like uh, uh, gratuitous things that were there just for sensationalism purposes, or at least that was the front of it, for the matter. I think that a lot of sensationalism uh, motivation was there as well, because there are a lot of ways to do the same thing without necessarily uh, having people in in explicit situations, let's say. Um, well, um, however, I do think that this was new. Oh no! I'll just, our... I'll just go on to say, mm -hmm. yeah, they they actually they fully did, you know, full sex position in these older things. They did, you know, they had the people having sex and the actual story continuing while they did it, and it was part of the story that has happened. Okay. Yeah, I don't know. I haven't seen them, so I wouldn't know. Uh, but uh, some of the stuff that supposedly was... Um, um, I think it's almost like a, like the musical, in the sense that you have a lot of musicals. They are called musicals, but not all of them use the music in the same way. Like the, There are some that interrupt the story for the song. Uh, whether they are classics or not, they still do that. And there are others that actually advance the narrative through the song and, and the story has advanced once the song is done and it's not just picking up again, it is just continuing with the flow. If you see if you if you know what I mean. Oh yeah, yeah. But, so um, if you think that this is what they did the, in those old movies, then fine. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, I don't I don't actually have my personal experience of them, so I don't have an opinion that I'll, I'll take your word for it oh definitely it was done in the old films like and the, the 70s porn films that like i said that did sort of advance from being porn into actual you know mainstream kind of films so they they transition it was rather an interesting effect um and yeah uh, a couple of australian tv series that would be good for people to look up uh, number 96 um uh uh this the uh, stories of Alvin Purple that was a, started as a film and then turned into a TV series uh, Chances, which was a, ni a 90s uh, TV series mm -hmm. that happened because of the um, the relaxing of standards on uh, pay TV, which was cable TV in Australia, so yeah they, um, it is not an uncommon mm -hmm. phenomenon right. Okay um, so then in, in that case you, we can say that it's not new definitely, okay um, and yet again, I still think that the point that we should be focusing on more is whether you actually, when do you actually need sex position and, and when don't you? When is it more because you feel it's going to make you edgier, like your story, not you, it will make the story edgier, and when is it that the story actually calls for it, and, and this is the the better way to present the story, unless uh, I don't know. What, what do you think? Um, I think that it is often not a, particularly a better way to present a story, but people use it in order to 
more easily grab viewers and keep them mm -hmm. so it's part of that it's part of like we're talking like a cheaper way to keep the viewers rather than being a um a clever way of maintaining the story unless we're talking about the art films from the 1960s you know these italian art films where they had done that kind of thing um, I can't um, remember the directors at the moment. Bertolucci, maybe? I'm not sure. Antonioni? Could be. There's, there's, a, there's a few that are very famous for this kind of stuff. And, you know, it, it's going to be... And the, the Spanish, uh, Almadovo, I think, he would, he would have this kind of stuff. Uh, has he done that kind of thing? Yeah, it was... Um, I wasn't aware of that. Yeah, that was. I think it's Almadovar. I'm not sure. I used to know all these kind of art films back in the '90s when, of course, you know, I love watching that kind of stuff for obvious reasons. Um, but yeah, um... <laughs> <laughs> it's for story purposes, isn't it? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and in, a... but the good thing about it is because of that purient interest, it's making you watch an art film which is a film that is created because it hasn't got the um it's a film that has not got the traditional uh like hooks to it that's going to make you interested in that you know mainstream films easy to understand simple popcorn fare you know action or whatever else so this is a, a very esoteric piece of film but they put these kind of things in it and that is what hooks you and really um you know in spite of yourself you're educated and you're actually watching an art film. And that was, you know, that was a, a, a common kind of trait for these kind of films. So it got people to watch these art films and be enlightened and interested in them. Would you, would you think that uh, Pasolini was one of those? Uh, sorry, what's the name? Pasolini. Pasolini. I, I can't say because like or I said. Fellini. Um, Fellini? Fellini. Oh, Fellini. Yes, yes, of course. Okay. Okay, now I know what you what you mean. Okay. Yeah. You know what? That particular one, um, he, he did the, the something, so, so many days of Sodom. I don't remember how many days. 120. Uh, 100, <laughs> yes, okay. 120 days of Sodom. And it was uh, projected... It was um, projected on Greek TV. I don't know how how many decades ago. I don't, I don't remember exactly, but it was uh, in uh, late night TV, and and it it got stopped by the DA uh, after multiple complaints over the oh. phone from viewers that this was way way too uh, gratuitously portraying sex and uh, sexual perversions. <laughs> And, and people didn't want to do that, yeah. you know, didn't and, want to have that on on, on uh, national TV, let's say. Yeah. So um, that's, and, that's how I, I um, know that one. <laughs> and this is the other side of it, because I was, as I was hinting, you know, this, uh, you know, we look at these things as more phenom phenomenologically. Like we look at them in isolation without sort of thinking about the the things that actually cause them and how it's yeah. happened before. So this has happened before. And what happens is we there is a cultural reaction to it because it gets, it gets okay. overdone. Obviously, because it works, people start using it more and more. Then eventually that there a reaction happens to it and we have standards, we have uh, ratings and things. And they say, okay, sorry, you can't do that anymore, or you can only do it within this limited, uh, there's a lot of restrictions on it. So then it doesn't make sense to do it anymore because it won't garner the viewership that you want because there's too many restrictions and you mm -hmm. can't show it as widely as you can. So why would you bother doing all that extra stuff? Yeah, and I, and I do think that when that happens, when people push back to that extent, sorry, one second. <coughs> It is because when you are oversexing things, uh, as is happening generally in pop culture today, when I say today, I mean currently. I mean, we have an over-sexualization of, of things that 
uh, are or are not closely connected to sex. Um, and, and when that happens, you what is, what is happening is that uh, people are actually pushed to be in a certain mindset that they aren't supposed, quote unquote, to be in for that amount of time and for such a prolonged period. It's it's um, like uh, people are built for balance, whether we like it or not. So when you oversex things, there will be a pushback of wanting um, to just uh, not be stimulated that way for a period of time. And then you get go to all to the other extreme and, and you have complete... Um, uh, lack of stimulation in that particular area so people are becoming crazed about it and and then you get again you go to the other extreme again and so we have this pendulum movement between being over explicit for a long or prolonged period of time and then over constrictive and puritan if you like mm -hmm. for again a prolonged period period of time and it's a vicious circle in a sense which should like I think the healthy thing would be to just let it settle in the normal levels of exposure <laughs> that would just, that would just uh, be it would teach people that uh, sex is a natural process that exists but within its own ratio let's say of uh, the human experience like the human experience isn't only sex. Of course. And when you don't have sex, it doesn't mean that you are not pushing the limits of art, for example, or pushing the limits of humans or, or whatever. So what I'm saying is that certain associations are being made where certain things are considered either cool or progressive or edgy or sexy or attractive only if they have a specific pattern or a, a checklist of elements that maybe are not being are not required by what is being presented, or are even redundant uh, with regards to what is being presented or what is being narrated. And this is what causes then at some point a pushback of you know stop let's let's stop with this excess, and then we go to the other excess of you know how dare you sir let uh, people, you know, have a red lipstick on or, or something. Indeed. I so, mean, there's uh, very strong examples of that with the, uh, the censorship in Hollywood in the 19, you know, after the excesses in the, the 1920s, um, or mm -hmm. whatever that was, 1910s, I'm, it's 1930s. Then you have very, very strong censorship in these films in that, you know, sexuality is limited right down to nothing. You didn't even have people in the same bed in TV shows in America right up into the, the 1970s. You have that kind of stuff. And in the other way, you have, like, a, say, in Spain, where they had extremely strong censorship under the fascist regime of uh, General Franco for years and years. And when that finally ended, then you had extreme reaction to that going the other way with massive sexuality in in all sorts of things you know in the art films but also in in the arts in general you know they would have um like live sex shows as part of art performances just because it was mm -hmm. that reaction to that extreme period of extreme censorship that happened so yeah it's, it's quite damaging to go to either extreme because it distorts culture quite significantly when that happens. Yes, exactly. And, and it also doesn't allow, I think when this happens, you also have a, a stunt in the development of culture and civilization in general. People cannot grow either way. Uh, or they grow in very weird ways that may lead down paths that perhaps are not necessarily healthy, let's mm. say, let's put it that way. So, um, yeah, I think that sex position as a tool should be in an artistic toolbox, let's say, but it should uh, be respected for what it is. Shouldn't be used just uh, like, okay, oh my God, they have an, a, a 
a boring info dump. Quick, let's uh, throw them in in a whorehouse and yeah. have them distracted there for no reason. Yeah. <laughs> like, uh, okay, we're going uh, to do, as I said, uh, your accounting. Where do you want to do the accounting? Let's go to the peep show and, uh, <laughs> you know, bring, bring your uh, uh, calculators and, and, and your spreadsheets, please. Okay, so... <laughs> Um, it it doesn't mesh very well, is what I'm saying very often. Or or when you want to show that your character is very very smooth and slick and everything, and and there are a lot of uh, bullets flying overhead and everything, and uh, somehow this raises his libido, and the discussion of what to do next and how to escape happens while making out with a lady. Oh, yeah, that's... Uh... And lately, or, or lately, making out with a, with a gentleman. Okay, even more edgy. Yeah. So, uh, yes, even edgy. <laughs> um, and more progressive and stuff. So, in general, if you do that, it's, in my opinion, it's poor writing or poor directing or poor whatever. If... If you're going to do this exposition, make it make sense. And if you can't do that, just don't use it. There are other ways to spice up. Yeah, people <laughs> tend to grab on to fads and then mm-hmm. just do them to do them because everyone else is doing them. And it become can become annoying because of that and oversaturating. Um it can be quite funny, though, in some way. Say The Witcher uh, is a series I'm sure a lot of people have watched. There's a scene there mm-hmm. that this um, this particular character, Yennefer the Witch, she is mm-hmm. basically specialising in love potions and things like that. You know, some kind of uh, interest she develops. Anyway, uh, she converts the mayor's house into uh, her own little uh, little. Uh, place to do her work and we see that she's bewitched the entire town to have an orgy in the uh the basement of this uh this house and when the witcher comes to see her so people are all doing this action in the background but it is totally ridiculous because everyone is posing in such a way to hide their naughty bits and when the action finishes you know and everyone kind of wakes up and they go oh my god what am i doing here they're waking up and they're Bodies are all posed in such a way, to, and it's just so funny because that's so yeah. contrived. Everyone's and, like, and also, the, the, yes, that that was ridiculous. When I saw it, I was saying, "Okay, all right." But the thing is that afterwards, okay, you wake up in a group orgy that you don't remember going, and you don't remember what happened, and you are naked, you know, and the whole mayor's council is also there naked and everything. There is no riot. Nobody asks the witch why she is there and and why this is happening. Nobody tries to burn the witch. Uh, sounds li- a little weird. Like it's a, okay. Oh, okay. I woke up in this place where I did unspeakable things or very sexy things. I don't know. <laughs> with uh, a whole lot of uh, unknown people, and now I'm just gonna go home and see what's for dinner. I guess. So. <laughs> It doesn't really make much, much sense, except you know exa- exactly being for gratuitous purposes and for reasons that only are for the benefit of the audience and not the story, certainly not the characters. Yeah, if so. This is why you have to be. It, there's no problem with using sex position. You just have to be intelligent about using it. It's a tool in. It should be a tool in your toolbox if you're able to use it because it's, if standards allow, like they do on Drunk Duck. If you want to have a comic with this kind of stuff, that's fine. Just gotta be, you know, intelligent about how you use it, and mm-hmm. you can you can further your story this way, especially if it is it is not an alien thing to your characters. You know, say this is something that is very much a part of the character say your character is like a prostitute or something like that or maybe your character you know actually has a very strong relationship with another character and it helps to show that aspect of their lives in order to further the story that that can be quite useful for that 
Well, mm -hmm. if you're just tacking this on because you want to show sex in a scene and it really doesn't matter, well, then that will look tacked on and it will look awkward. So, yeah, you know, it, it's and a I good also way. have to okay. say, yeah, oh, please, I say, I it's, it's it a was... good way to further the whole kind of you know 360 view of a character because you don't have to shy away from that. Say, if you've got a story about, say, um, like a famous love story between uh, uh um where are we um darcy and uh what's her name in the that sorry elizabeth elizabeth and darcy yeah so you got this this uh pride and prejudice okay so you're doing that kind of story but you're actually you know showing them getting together because that is part of your story you know you you can go mm -hmm. more than just having them wooing each other actually the it's a very funny thing that but in the 19th century this is a story about these two characters making love in the 19th century making love meant wooing someone so this is courting mm -hmm. going to approach someone in order to um to uh, woo them it had no sexual connotations at all that is this is purely a 1960s 1970s reimagining of the term so making love had nothing to do with yeah. having sex it's an older term for for courting anyway so these characters were making love but in these days you could have that story and you could actually show them making love uh, especially on a, a comic on drunk duck um you know the modern version of that the meaning of that word because you want to show yeah. a full 360 version of their relationship and their love and you know how they interact with each other and that is fine so yeah yes and i, and I also i also would like to suggest though the other side of the coin to this in the sense that sometimes just like in a very good thriller not thriller a horror a very good horror film where uh the secret to the greatest impact impact is to show the least possible and allow the human imagination to go into the dark places and so people get more scared okay in the same way if you can do it and if you feel that this is the way to go okay i'm not saying that this is the way to go a hundred percent but uh it could be much more compelling to imply this exposition in a way that is very um, suggestive so and allows your, your mind to feel it. And I have a film in mind that does this very, very well. It's, it's highly artistic, very well recommended if you are ready to be exposed to the content. And what I'm talking about is... Mm -hmm. Uh, what, uh, the, the title of the movie I'm talking about is The Third Wife. It is a Vietnam film, and it is the story of a, of a, of a, of a woman, whom I say, a child. She was a 14-year-old child in the, I think, 19th century um, Vietnam, uh, or 18th century Vietnam. Anyway, but it's an old time, let's say, period piece, okay, where the the bride, she is the third bride of a very rich uh, landowner, and she is only 14 years old. And she gets married into this family that uh, she is there basically to, to bear children, to be a sexual object for this man. And the, the, the genius of this movie is that you never actually see any explicit sexual scene. The only thing that you see is her face oh, during really? the sex. Oh, wow. Yes. But you understand absolutely everything to a point that is extremely painful. It is cruel to watch. It is very disturbing uh, in a way that I don't think it would be if you had the titillating element of actually showing the act beyond her face because you do see her face in real time quote unquote mm -hmm. okay so during the, yeah yeah yes and that that is devastating okay and that is actually true talent i'm going to find the imdb for it to to paste and i do like this is i think sex position in its best because you have a scene 
where sex is taking place on screen, you don't actually see the sex itself, but you see its impact. And it is completely given to the narrative of the situation, the, the character uh, development, the character analysis, the social analysis. It, 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 you, are, uh, you become part of the scene because she is basically looking at you. So you can imagine how, how interactive it is with you. And it depends on how you feel and where you feel you are during the scene. Let me put it this way. So it, it is genius, but it is very hard to watch. Extremely hard to watch. Sounds like it, yeah. On the other side, I'm going to find it in a second, but on the other side, not other side, on the other end of the spectrum, <laughs> you have sex position, the type of uh, Fifty Shades of Grey, where that is definitely not what is happening. You have a lot of you know, uh, suggestive situations and a lot of explicitly descript, uh, described uh, things and vocabulary and everything. And I guarantee you that it doesn't actually reach anyone and doesn't really give any kind of emotion. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's not very intelligently so, done. It's um, rather simplistic. I'm going to find an IMDb now. Highly recommended, but uh, you have been warned. Uh, let, let's say that it has a lot of uh, trigger warnings for abuse, child abuse, sexual abuse, Here. and yeah. sexual abuse. Mm -hmm. Grim. Well, the thing is, like as you were saying, you can you can get away with showing. Well, you can get away with um, depicting. <laughs> representing a lot more kind of awful things happening on the screen well happening in your story if you don't show them if you're making the audience imagine them in the screen in their head this is a good way of getting around this and this is actually one of the tools people had to use when censorship was very strong we had to be more suggestive and in doing so, you could uh, have a, a much harder hitting story because you could show things. Um, you couldn't show them, but you could suggest things that you could never show, mm -hmm. even if you were allowed to show stuff. It would it would have a much harder impact because the audience is imagining the full horror of what's happening. Exactly. That is... And I haven't seen... And I hadn't, uh, I didn't know this uh, movie existed when I wrote the article. Otherwise, it would have been a prime example. So anyway, I posted it in for anyone who wants to check it out. The third Just uh, again, wife. Yeah. Well, we will have it on our notes, in, mm -hmm. so people will be able to have a look at this film if they are brave enough. And I, I definitely think it was a snub. For the Oscars, I don't think it was in the Oscar for foreign movies nominations. I don't think it was. Oh, no nomination. Yeah. And I think that was a super snub. Well, the Oscars are an interesting thing. Um, that would be it. Would be a fascinating quackcast to talk about the purpose of award shows, the real purpose, rather than the um, the audience imagination. Mm -hmm. of award shows. I, I think we can basically say they're mainly about promotion rather than actually uh, rating things yeah. from, from good or rewarding things for being good. It, it's more of a tool of um, promotion for the film industry, which is an important thing yeah, to realise. Um, yeah, I agree. So, yeah, <laughs> um, there are many different reasons for having sex on the screen while you're actually having the story showing it and it is not necessarily a part of a continuing trend so um actually um you know even like this idea of that people do have that it's like okay this is how things are now this is just what we're going to get used to that 
even that has uh, been a trait in the past. Um, say the author, author Orson Scott Card, that people may real recognise from uh, the movie Ender's Game, the famous series. So in his uh, science fiction, he's got stories where um, it's like talking about this uh, future world that everyone you know is in the future of Earth, and uh, in the narrative, there's um, uh, like the TV shows people watch actually depicts like like uh, commonly like sexual behaviour, and this is in every kind of TV show everything like soaps children's tv everything there's sexual behavior the actors are actually you know getting involved in sex and he was basically you know these stories might have been written in the the early 80s or the 70s or something like that but he he was writing as science fiction writers do extrapolating from okay this is what i'm seeing on the tv now this is what i'm seeing on movies i believe that this trend will continue this is the ultimate kind of uh expression of this trend because i think this is happening and this will continue to go on this way so yeah even back then people were thinking that that you know because there was sex on the on the tv or in movies and you know it was being used to like everyone was doing it no matter what you know in two forward stories that would continue forever and ever and ever and just get worse and worse and worse but mm -hmm. what i'm saying is you know even though we're seeing it now this um this is will will not be a continuing trend i'm saying my uh my prediction is that there will be some kind of pushback in some way and that will stop maybe maybe we'll have a balance maybe things will go down and there will just be a, a constant balance and you know this will become like a small part of of the films and the tv shows and it will never you know get in become extreme or whatever else you know that's possible but my prediction is it will increase a bit and then it will increase and then there'll be some kind of pushback and then we'll go uh you know, there'll be like a restriction against that and i think we might already be seeing that in that mm -hmm. now we have netflix is under pressure from disney which is now they have a much a much huger control over all media because they bought up everything you know they've got like marvel and they've got uh studio ghibli films and they've got everything and they're eroding netflix's market share and disney have traditionally a much stricter kind of um uh, view on censorship and sexuality in their products and, and that's especially because, you know, they have, uh, you know, the American um, uh, evangelical kind of owners and stuff like that. There's all these kind of pressures on the people who own them to, to what they can show. So, and if that happens, if they erode Netflix's market share to so much of an extent, then Netflix is not going to be, you know, there's not going to be any reason for them to sort of, uh, to have as much sexuality as they do because they just won't be able to have the market to justify all the hoops I'll have to jump through in order to show that. So th this is the kind of thing you've got to think about. Anyway. Yeah, I think the, the problem, oh, please, Baines, go. No, go ahead. So I, I'm thinking, I think generally that the problem is that there is um, a tendency, especially coming from Hollywood, but not only from Hollywood, that they have to be the ones that dictate to audiences how they should feel and what they should want to watch and to what extent they should watch it. Like They, they have this uh, almost didactic approach to, okay, this is the cool thing or this is the progressive thing or this is the right thing. You know, insert your value yeah. judgment of choice here. And, and this is uh, what you should do and how you should do it uh, as a consumer of uh, media. Mm. And, and I think the more that people are being force-fed, like uh, foie gras ducks, <laughs> certain things, the more they're going to throw it up because it's a reaction. If, they, if, they, if that was a pattern that was dropped and instead... 
there was um, a sort of interactive dialectic, let's say, approach in the sense that, okay, let's see what the audience in general, in, in mainstream, wants to see. Let's see what uh, the, you know, plus one, plus two standard deviations want, want to see and use this zone of proximal development to push certain ideas and see how this land. I think that would create a much more stable terrain and perhaps a healthier terrain on uh, what movies would display that would not force people to push back and have extreme reactions that then lead to extreme legislation or extreme mm. norms, so to speak. So, but yeah, it, it's the idea of, uh, you know, I know what's best and uh, you are going to have it and like it. You know, that's the, that attitude, which of yeah. course never works. <laughs> so, yes, yeah. and it can go either way. I think I cannot recall exactly I think this might have been one of the influences for the rise of the musical in that mm -hmm. they couldn't show explicit scenes, you know, whether violence or sex or whatever, but they could indicate this sim, you know, in a more symbolic way through song, through a performance. So I think that was the right, that was a behind uh, the rise of the musical in that you could be symbolic because a lot of people don't realize that uh, the dance scenes or the musical scenes in musicals are a different way of conveying the story extremely symbolically like say the fight scene mm -hmm. in West Side Story so you're not showing yeah. people getting stabbed and cut up and having a massive battle you're having a, like, this dance scene with each other but you're not actually showing a dance scene this mm -hmm. is symbolic what you're actually showing is a fight scene, but absolutely in a different way. So yeah, that's and this has happened in Bollywood films in that they had to show um, dance dancers and all sorts of singing performance and stuff like that. But they're not literally singing or dancing. The characters are actually using that as a symbolic way to explain what's actually happening between the characters. So this is what always annoys me when people say, oh, why are they just suddenly dancing? You know, blah, blah, blah. I think you, you really got to like, okay, I'm not going to call you an idiot, but you're going to have to watch it and think about why this, this scene's here and realize that the characters are doing something else. This is symbolically explaining what, what something else about the characters in the story. It's not actually the characters literally mm -hmm. stopping what they're doing yeah. and dancing. Anyway, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm going well, to yeah, tangent. I think it depends. No, it's not a tangent. I, I actually would like to to explore that a little further in the sense that, and that's another good thing. In the, okay, I'm, I'm going to say the first thing first and then not conflate it with the next one. Um, so, yeah, often uh, there are certain musicals that present certain contexts in uh, through dance so that there is no censorship element to, to worry about. Uh, other times, they literally do stop the story and the action for them to just break into song, and then when they are done, the action continues. Like, you don't actually earn anything from the song itself because it's just violently inserted into it. That's uh, actually a very big problem with La La Land, and it, it makes it unwatchable. Um, oh, really? So it doesn't my... intelligently handle the dance and the singing like a musical actually should. It just handles it yes, like exactly. a child's version of a musical, like someone who doesn't understand exactly. what a musical is. And again, it comes down to whether you know how to use your tools in your narrative toolbox. Um, and uh, But the, the other thing is that when you don't let yourself or you are not allowed to immediately go for the explicit thing. Like, uh, okay, let's throw the actors on bed and have them, you know, hump each other. Hmm. Uh, um, if we want to show that, but cannot show the actual literal thing, we, come, we can come up with a lot of artistic ways to do it that are a lot more creative and actually a lot more challenging artistically for the audience 
and the creator as well. I'm not saying that this is only, you know, yes, let's not, uh, let's censor everything. But if we challenge ourselves a little bit, like instead of immediately going for the kill, try to sort of dance around it and maybe leave it alive for a little bit <laughs> um, is, a, is a, a thing that artists and creators, I think, should consider. It does help you grow as a creator. I mean, it can be restricting and it can be stifling to have too many restrictions on yourself, but it can also mm -hmm. help you grow in unusual ways, you know, like a, mm -hmm. a, a pot plant. You know, the, uh, the root system, if it's constricted by the pot, can be square and it will stunt your plant's growth. But if you're... You know, if it if it's a tree or something, and it's got like a curb to grow around or a bit of road, it can do all sorts of amazing and weird things. So you can you can actually grow with your restrictions and use them, and mm -hmm. and that can be part of your story. Um, for my comic Pinky, yeah, Pinky T A. When I first started, I thought, well, look, I'm going to have the full range of human expression, so I'm not going to have any sort of boundaries. I'm going to show sexuality in my comic if I feel like it, and that's just going to be how it is. And as I was doing it, yep, yeah, sure, that was that was fine. And then I came across the idea of ratings on Drunk Dark Comics, and ratings restrict your audience. So that was something I bumped into. And I, after a while, I thought, well, I don't want my audience restricted. I don't want uh, me my comic to only be viewable by these particular people. I want my comic to be viewed by as many people as possible. And because of that, I started putting restrictions on my comic and not showing the full range of sexuality anymore and you know when I did sort of hint at things like that I would do it in cleverer ways and uh, hide it and so that actually was more interesting to me because you can you can show what you what you want and sure you can get away with that but it's actually more interesting to have uh, restrictions on yourself and try and get around those and still mm -hmm. show what you want without actually yeah. showing it. That's, yeah. that's a very interesting problem. Mm -hmm. So it does help you grow. And, and uh, your audience is, mm -hmm. yeah, your audience is uh, wider. Go on, Tan, sorry. Yeah. Um, on the other hand, I also want to say that there are certain things, again, that can show a lot of things without telling uh, that you can also use. Like I'm thinking, for example, um, that if you show a certain situation, not again too explicitly, but enough to give the idea so people can picture in their minds what you want them to picture in their minds, it can uh, tell a lot about a character or a situation that uh, will resonate with the message that you want to give. And I'm thinking like, uh, for example, in Without Moonlight, I don't really have sex scenes. And, and the point of the story is not definitely about human sexuality. But there is one character introduction that I make through, he, not hinting, side presenting, let's say, a sex scene. So, and the reason that I chose to do that was because I wanted to particularly get across certain messages for the particular character that would be a lot more economical to show in a single frame with a hint of a sexual act taking place than need to spend three, four, five scenes to show the same, let's say, gist of uh, who she is, what she stands for, and how she goes about getting certain things. So, mm. well, and this, uh, oh, that was more efficient. That was more efficient. But again, I didn't want to, you know, go to town with the whole sex scene because that was not the point. The point was to just give the hint, give the taste, and move on. So you have to realize the parameters you're working with. So Without Moonlight is not a comic about, uh, it's not a, 
about sexy kind of stuff this is a rather serious war comic so you've got that as your baseline and if it was suddenly to become very sexy that would be quite incongruous to the story so that would uh, be a bit of a jolt but this particular character iris she is quite sexual in a sort of matahari way and mm -hmm. how do you show that unless you show it so you you actually have to <laughs> to show it or else yeah. it, it there would be it would be rather silly to have that kind of a character and not actually show how she works. So yeah, that's exactly. that's where you ran up against. So yeah, that was yeah, but, but a again, challenge. there is no need exactly, but there is no need to actually show her doing doing it for like a five pages, for example, let's say, uh, or yeah. for yeah. Uh, an entire page, because we all know how you know the mechanics. And the methods of the matter. <laughs> the point isn't that uh, it's nothing new. The point is the choice, the context, the location, who she does it with, when she does it, and what is the purpose behind it. And as long as these things are conveyed, everything else is, at least in this particular story and narrative, would be gratuitous and it would mm. be simple for sensationalism or I don't know, fan service if you would like to call it in any case it wouldn't offer anything to the, to the narrative itself It would take away from the rest of your story yeah, yeah. too because it would change exactly. the tone too much so, yeah. I was going to say, yeah, it would exactly. actually take away yeah. So what about Typical Strange? Is there a problem with over-sexualizing Oscar? Yes, I mean... problematic Every day I get comments <laughs> And that word shows up constantly. That's what it's I've thought. I think he's oversexed that guy. It's, uh, it's intolerable. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> uh, there's definitely, it's there. It's uh, somewhere below the surface a lot, I would say. But uh, more like in a sort of older school comic book kind of way, in my opinion. Like it's there. There's a lot of like characters being in, in love and in lust and stuff like that. It mm -hmm. is there. I don't, I don't really show. I don't think there's ever been a panel of nudity in there. Recall. So we're not going to see Penelope oh. and Oscar <laughs> flouncing for five pages in a torrid, steamy affair. You, you're saying right no, now? No, if, that, if that version ever exists, I want to cut. <laughs> so don't get our hopes up unless you have like a, a, a guest illustrator. Yeah, I, I mean, I don't know. It just seems like people wouldn't I mean, not that people wouldn't like that necessarily. Some people would like that, maybe. I mean, not, I don't have a lot of fans anyway, but just speaking generally. But it's just, I don't know. It would be strange. It seems like that would be an odd thing to do with these characters. And it would be kind of, mm -hmm. I mean, I don't know. Who knows? No, we've got to get Elsie like to, quite fit. to do a guest story for you. Hey, for sure. And I think I, we I, can I, make that happen. I'd be, I'd be honored. Yeah. I'd be honored if you did that. Absolutely. He will 3D model. No, I mean, well, there is that. <laughs> What's that? No, I'm, I'm saying that there is that the rule of the internet. So Exactly. Yeah, rule 34 or 54. Yeah. Or 34, I think. I, I, I don't remember <laughs> the number. Yeah. Well, so, but, yeah. Uh, no, it's, yeah, it's, yeah, like I said, it's kind of there, but I don't really... <laughs> Nothing is really shown. I mean, it, there might be some, uh, there might be some sexuality to character poses. It's not explicit, like though. Yeah. No, there might be some. Well, yeah. Well, talking about this, um, we bring up the example of El Cid. Now, El Cid was quite famous for his uh, very um, extreme comic, Death Pron, but he has this other comic, mm -hmm. Trans Neptunian, which isn't quite so extreme but it definitely contains sex positions it's, his work is not my thing but um you know a lot of people enjoy it and that really does contain sex sex position um so yeah that this is an example of a comic on drunk up that that does this uh, it's popular people like it so for mm -hmm. i don't know all sorts of reasons i'm sure it just goes beyond people liking it because it has sex <laughs> I'm sure. I have to say, um, an amazing three D artist for starters. Talking about uh, what people like, 
And I, if we want to go full circle, we started with uh, Game of Thrones. If we want to go back to Game of Thrones a little, I remember that uh, before we had the fiasco of season eight and the sort of floundering but giving the benefit of the doubt season seven, uh, I remember that there was this general complaint that they had uh, toned down the sex scenes a lot in season five, I think. I think it was season five that had this complaint. Uh -huh. But in my opinion, season five was the best <laughs> because it had all the political intrigue and and it was engaging in this manner. And, and uh, it was just right. It still did have, you know, the, the sexiness of the matter because it's Game of Thrones. But the the tension came from the political intrigue and i found particular for me i found that season five was uh, one of the best oh, really? so yeah it, it could also be personal taste if you want you know to have explicit scenes in your movies and in your narratives and stuff and that's also a personal choice and taste and others like me, I don't really like it unless it makes sense. Like I, I can feel the reason why it's there. So, actually, yeah. um, there there is an interesting, almost an equation to this. Uh, apparently, I uh, was I heard it on a podcast by um, uh, Mr. Skin. So this this is the uh, the guy who created this whole website about finding nude scenes in Hollywood movies and TV shows and cataloging them. So it's a ridiculous kind of thing. Anyway, uh, he made the interesting point that in any series, any series, uh, especially these, these newer ones, you know, that are streaming, the internet-based ones, the amount of sexuality is uh, strong in the first season and the first couple of seasons and then will always taper off. And the reason behind that was the the creators of these series use that to build a fan base. They use that to build mm -hmm. an audience. And after they've got that, and the actors have actually become a bit more noted and a bit more famous, they don't really want to do sex scenes anymore. They don't, they don't even want to do nudity. And the the creators actually don't need to show it anymore because they've already got the viewership they've already got the dedicated fans so that is one of the reasons why in later seasons of these things it tends to taper off just as a function so there's That's, there's a marketing reason sense. for it yeah and also yeah uh, a social reason for it with the actors not wanting to do that anymore because you know they become big names and they don't have to get their kid off in order to make their money <laughs> so <laughs> it's interesting in that so yeah, um, uh, what other shows? Uh, the Deuce. This is one that is very known for this. Um, uh, we have um, Westworld. So you know, um, uh, uh, Deadwood. So these are other series. You know, a whole bunch of them. Deadwood. I'm just writing these down. The Deuce. Westworld, and there are many, many, many others. Um, because, yeah, of course, the the current um, the current paradigm with uh, you know um, media is you know this internet stuff. So you know less restrictions, they can get away with it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, um, should we wrap up now, guys? Yeah, sure. I think I think uh, we have explored the matter. <laughs> the matter. We have plumbed it to its depths. <laughs> okay, now we have to. Couldn't you help yourself, could you? <laughs> we have to sterilize now. We have to um, decontaminate. <laughs> right. Only those that weren't wearing gloves, you know. <laughs> Full surgical gown. <laughs> okay, all right. Thank you very much for listening to the Quackhouse, Quackhouse number 463. I'm Ozan Ocean, and with me has been Tance and Baines. And if you want thank to see, you. oh, thank you, thank you. Okay. And if you want to see more, literally see more, you can go and look at our Patreon video. There is no nudity on that. No, we don't uh, go uh, to those kind of uh, 
extremes no, in we, order to we get are, viewership. We are interesting enough without any sex position. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Always. Season one of the Quack Cast is no longer available, so you missed all that. Yeah. <laughs> Unfortunately, <laughs> yes. You'll have to pay Maybe a lot extra for that. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> all right. All right. Goodbye, people. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.